was in 1994 for Comdex, uh, you know, only 100,000 people. It was our general MIDI synthesizer, you know, operating in real time on a laptop. Never, nothing like it ever been done. Uh, and this is what my company had produced and what I had designed and architected, put the deal together, the team, the over. I had participated in the original MIDI in 1983, as, uh, uh, interfacing with Roland, uh, that's a whole another era, generation. I had, everybody knows, I, Dave and I, Dave Kusek and I massaged the general MIDI spec that came in from Roland uh, to become the general MIDI spec eventually. It could be, a, I was former member of the MMA's uh, technical committee for General MIDI 2. It could be therefore assumed by a reasonable person that I sort of knew what a General MIDI synthesizer was. Oh, in addition, by the way, to my book, uh, General MIDI, which was reviewed as a technical standard for all other, uh, by the Audio Engineering Society, of which I'm not a member, uh, reviewed it as a uh, book for all others to be judged by. So, putting that evidence together, you might assume that I know what a general MIDI synthesizer was, and with that confidence, I applied to the MIDI Manufacturers Association for a logo, a general MIDI logo, for uh, my software synthesizer. Uh, this is 2009 today, a year of August, someday. I'm still waiting for a response. And this application was back in? 1992. Revived in a conversation with Tom White in 93 and revived again in 1994 and expressly dismissed with the answer that we're not uncomfortable, we're not comfortable with the idea of giving uh, MMA of GM logos to software synthesizers because we can't, we're not sure that we can be assured of their voice count. At what point do you call the white coats? So, uh, uh, so this is their response to me. The, the, who fucking created the system, and we might as well leave that on there, or you can bleep that on there. They're telling me they're not going to give me a logo <clears throat> because they will give it to a uh, a sound canvas, which has a variable architecture, and if you select certain timbres will only play 12 notes because they stack their oscillators but they won't give it to the software. Now at this point I'm starting to think that the MMA just might be slightly biased towards hardware. And, and of course I quit. This led to my resigning from the organization as quickly thereafter as was practicable. We had Pan. That's what I remember. Perry Leopold's Pan. The Performing Artist Network. Uh -huh. was? <clears throat> Performing Artist Network. Yeah, that was, and he he did the most pioneering work in trying to get unified, you know, bulletin boards where people could do patches and have uh, dialogue and stuff like that. Um, but there was nothing like that. I was a little bit out of that, but. I first heard about it when Abram started talking about Mosaic, but I think that was in '95. So, and, and, and when you're when you're talking about patches that they had on Pan, are we talking about the SysX files or what? What, what sort of yeah, what, I think, what conventions I think, were there? I think so. Like if you had a DX7 or whatever you had, uh, MIDI MIDI had this great way of doing all everything. You could do anything with MIDI, <laughs> depending on your expectations for compatibility. Um, and so you could store most instruments that could store their sounds, but it would have to be in their own custom format, at least, not least of which because every instrument you know, would be designed differently. There was just no cooperation or a common format. So uh, uh, people could share, if they had DX7s, they could share sounds as DX7s, but you couldn't do anything like create a piece using DX7s and then have it play back on another studio for a whole bunch of reasons, not least of which is the sounds, but like if you read my book, you can, the MIDI 
was like a utility that brings the water and the electricity up to the house, but inside the house the wiring is all different, it goes to different rooms, the switches are different, the operation inside the house, the faucets, so, yeah, yeah, maybe the plum last time the plumber put in too hot, so one yeah, you turn in the same direction instead of hot and cold. Uh, so you get this type of compatibility between the houses because it's a utility, but inside the house um, you couldn't really translate the operation. You couldn't take what you know of how to operate your wall, your light switches in your house, go to a completely different house and have your knowledge translate. And that's basically the problem that you have when you ask a music to go between different MIDI studios because of the incompatibilities at the fundamental level between the hardware. Again, my fundamental motivation for going to software. You have to remember, folks, uh, there was a time when we didn't have MIDI files. And so not only would the person, a MIDI file is the lowest common denominator, sort of, which allows you to take your MIDI data from one sequencer, you output it to a MIDI file, and then you can load it up into another sequencer, and that's pretty good. Something, most of the stuff, the data goes across, that's cool. Um, but we didn't even have that, so uh, in that area we were discussing for PAN, generally um, uh, you'd have to both have be using the same sequencer. So you'd have to send a sequence file. And so this was only something that musicians could do between themselves. You couldn't really, pu really publish anything because you couldn't be at all in any way know what the target would be. And you certainly couldn't ask the person to go out and buy a sound card or, or this or that. Just so, so like a MIDI file that might have sounded just fine, played on a DX7, played on a a Prophet T8 yeah. might sound nice, but completely unlike the composer's intended. Yeah, let's say even let's say you're the best intended. Let's say you had the most. You're a consumer with the best of intentions, and you go out and buy a a thousand dollar synthesizer or two thousand dollar synthesizer, and you go out and surf the bulletin boards to find sequences. Guess what? Almost none of them are going to play on your machine <laughs> without you doing a lot of work learning about MIDI when what you thought you wanted to do was play music. General MIDI was a starting point and, and a good, it was better than nothing. Um, you at least had an agreement on basic kinds of sounds that would occur. Um, more importantly, and as I point out in my book, you really had an empirical standard. Uh, people could talk what they want about the paper standards and argue what they want about the paper, you know. But the fact of the matter is, is that the sound canvas was for all intents and purposes to find what general MIDI was um, as far as how things were supposed to sound. That's the Roland desktop unit. Right? Yeah, it was uh, originally called the SC55. And actually, it came out uh, nine months, I think, before general MIDI without a general MIDI logo because they, they weren't willing to wait. And they had a bigger idea, they had this idea first. And then, actually, that's not true. There was a company called Sight and Sound. And I have in my archives somewhere a paper from the 80s in which uh, they suggested uh, a standard patch layout for synthesizers amongst the manufacturers. But if you want to talk that context, then you have to really go and give credit to a lot of the writers, the magazine writers, and, and our, all our people like uh, uh, Craig Anderton, and Dominic Manolano, Paul Lehrman, uh, all of the knowledgeable people, uh, um, and I don't want to leave anybody out, but uh, uh, you could go on and on. Um, many people that would make noise and noise and noise about the problems of a lack of a standard language or a lack of this or that, but um, the unfortunate situation is a small industry and you can only do so much in terms of standardization. And it was only until, as I, the, another point made in the book, it was only until sales had flattened because of the chaos that I was talking about, um, pros had tapped out, they couldn't distribute, they could make their own, they're all stupid, how much stuff can you buy? Um, you want to publish and you can't do it. So pro sales had flattened and all the consumers were scratching their heads going, 
But the computer says it has MIDI in it, but I don't know, it doesn't make any noise. And so there was a real chaos on my hands, and it wasn't until Warner and other people started demanding from the MIDI people this response uh, of, you know, come on, do something, would you? And then, fortunately, Roland really did. This sort of grows into sort of a general philosophical argument that we were having at the time about the role of multimedia. How much interaction do we want, do we really want, in our multimedia? You know, people still, at the end of the day, I think there's a lot, you know, they still sit on their butt and watch TV passively a lot. That's a lot of it. The advantages of MIDI are that it allows manipulation, it allows interaction, it allows we're not yet in our discussion at the context where MIDI really starts to take off with the advantage, which is what I thought, uh, when you marry it to a website, when you want quick interaction. Even on our cell phone ringtones today, even though I could compactly give you the same tune with 20K, you tend to take the clip right from the popular tune. Um, MIDI is you can't go back from once a, once a, once you have your popular hit and the identity that a song sounds a certain way unless it was created in MIDI you can't go deconstruct it back into MIDI into a way that would be useful um, so you really have to design it from the start and in the multimedia context you might want to do that um, but it really there was a double whammy here which happened, which was that people got another compact way of doing things at the same time, which was MP3. And they got them from free, for free, because they were stealing them all. Uh, so at the same time that MIDI started to enter the multimedia arena, MP3 got released and really put a, a really just slammed the place as far as people's willingness to deal with interactivity. Uh, because all of a sudden, MP3 could provide a solution. You could steal anything you want um, and resample it and lower, you know, you could lower the resolution, which all, once people discovered that, that became a fashion and a sound in itself. And uh, so uh, the competitive benefits of MIDI were really left still untapped. Once you convert the instrument itself to software, you send the instrument. And if the instrument requires what we call a synthesizer engine, mm -hmm. uh, which, you know, is a low-level, you know, number crunching, filter generating, you know, thing, um, you make sure that's installed in advance. But that's just software if you do it in software. And so, the whole idea was to just send what you needed down the wire. So the claim is made that the general MIDI book is prior art which somehow disqualifies a patent. Okay, well, let's, let's talk about that. What is prior art? Fortunately, I have to lecture on the subject to them because the FF doesn't understand what prior art is. Uh, it's acknowledged that invention is incremental. For example, a typewriter. It consists of gears and levers. Um, that doesn't mean that a typewriter, just because it's reducible to a, con a set of gears and levers, is not patentable, let's say. So you can have elements existing out there before, as prior art, gears and levers existed before somebody put it into, together into a typewriter. That doesn't mean the fact that a gear and a lever existed doesn't disqualify the typewriter as being an invention. Okay. In order to be prior art, the so-called art has to anticipate the invention in every way. It has to be, or it has to be functionally equivalent. There's a doctrine of equivalence. So there was a line in your general MIDI book they were referring to, is that right? Uh, there may be. Uh, what, I, I don't know. Something about down, 
downloading the files or yeah, something. Yeah, like downloading into hardware. Yeah. In the Look, downloading the hardware. The book was written before the invention. The book was written, as I say in the preface, when I was chairman of the General MIDI Level 2 Committee. The picture that I painted was to accommodate hardware. That would have been my role as General MIDI 2 Chairman, and that's what I wrote in the book. I said, I'm writing this as General MIDI 2 Chairman, and this thing, and all of the stuff that I talk about in there is about synthesizers competing about real estate. Well, software synthesizers don't have real estate, etc., okay. etc. Et it was all saying, there's still going to be limitations, but we can get there if we just admit that we have to make things more intelligent. Wake up and realize that the future, that if you really want it, the future that you're trying to sell in the magazines, uh, make your instruments soft, send the engine down the wire as well. But when you have commitments to factories and installations and foundries, and your company, it's just not that easy to make that shift. Mm. You're, when you're, especially when you dominate the industry. So uh, we were conceptually too early, and uh, then people, then we sort of, you know, people forgot about us, and now that people are using our techniques, they think that. They thought of them. <laughs> Just because the market's ready finally. Right. When we were fighting for the concept and the market, we put our amount money where our mouth is since 95. Unfortunately, to get anybody's attention, we had to sue the largest software company in the world. And then the largest music manufacturing company in the world. And we figure that should get people's attention. And if it doesn't, yeah, we're in re-examination. And when we get out of re-examination, they'll know that too.